the witnesses. Just a couple of questions of my own, if, if you don't mind, please. Just going back to the, the question of flu and preventing people getting flu, because clearly the symptoms of flu and, and having flu, it, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a contradiction in terms of being able to present to work and the risk to, to COVID-19. COVID Could I just go back to the view um, of the witnesses on making the flu vaccine mandatory. I know we've talked about the, the view, Ms Nihay, of, it, of promoting it and you have a figure of 37% and you said you think that the real figure is higher than that. But can you, can you outline what circumstances a healthcare worker would not wish to have the flu vaccine? Is there something that's preventing somebody from taking the flu vaccine? Is there something I, you know, we're not aware of that would make it difficult to make that uh, essential, if not mandatory, which has a different regulatory implication? Well, I think the first thing, um, and thank you for the question, Deputy, the, the first question, the first issue is whether the healthcare worker, no more than any other member of, of society, has an underlying health condition that uh, a flu vaccination would be contraindicated. That's the first one. Could you give me um, an example of that? What, what, um, what underlying conditions? Have again, that would depend on the underlying health condition. From our perspective, example, do, do we're, we're, very, we're very clear on this, just... that the, the healthcare workers that we represent we promote the uptake of Thank the you, vaccine. Thank you, Ms. Nihay. You did, you, you did say that. And just, just being more specific in my question, if you don't mind, to help me with my own understanding. For example, could you, could you name one or two conditions that are contraindications, like is diabetes, for example, a contraindication? Or is, could you name one or two conditions that where there's a contraindication with the flu vaccine? The, uh, my understanding is that it's allergy-based, and it depends on your particular allergy, depending on the vaccine that is produced. As my colleague um, from Forza said earlier, the vaccine this year is slightly different to the vaccine last year. So that is a constant matter that you have to discuss with your GP. But the point is that my view is, and the view of the union, um, the representing nurses and midwives is, that healthcare workers and nurses and midwives are encouraged and promote it, and they go further than that because they also contribute to the uptake by ensuring that other healthcare workers can have the vaccine in their place of work, and we provide that to them. I actually understand that and, and respect that, and I'm just trying to understand on an annual basis what list, you know, how is that list of contraindications, how it's communicated, how clear it is, you know, what, what those barriers would be. Recognising, I totally respect that there are some barriers for some people. Of course, the issue is that a healthcare worker who gets the flu will be deemed, I assume, to, to be of COVID-19 risk given the overlap of the symptoms or a risk of having COVID-19 given the overlap of the symptoms. And what we've discussed today about the risk of infection uh, from COVID-19 for healthcare workers and what we've also discussed from Mr King about people staying home for different reasons or being required to self-isolate, there's a clear overlap. So what can we do additionally this year to try to ensure that people do get the vaccine and take the vaccine for flu that we have? I think the, the HSE have done a good job in promoting the vaccine. I think we would encourage um, an escalation of that. Do it earlier and do it um, more broadly. Educate people about the uh, nature of the vaccine, the type of vaccine. Uh, there is a huge concern generally among the population. We hear it every year um, about vaccines in general. Uh, we don't subscribe to that. Our members who work as public health nurses are, um, are, are to the front line of providing a childhood immunizations and also um, the MENC um, men meningococcal vac vaccinations. So we promote vaccines. We believe that the uh, health service has to give correct information and contradict perhaps that information that's out there that is not based on science. Well, I agree with you completely in relation to that, of course. Uh, sorry, Chair, just to avoid being repetitive of the camp, but just to say that the, the, the the responses given by our colleague Phil in terms of the work that all of the unions do to encourage the uptake of the flu vaccination um, and would be something also that um, we would um, um, promote and um, advocate um, in SIPTU. Um, That's great. We would intend and hope that the specific question you raised in relation to the flu vaccination in the context of a second surge of COVID-19 is something that we will have intensive engagement with the HSE around. Okay, thank you. Um, just going back to some of the data from the HPSC, um, and it may have been helpful just to set this out very clearly at the outset. You know, we've all been using the same data from the 11th of July. So we've had eight uh, of the 26,076 COVID cases, 8,347%, 32% of those were healthcare workers with 319 hospitalised, 49 admitted to ICU, and very tragically, seven deaths of that. 
And I think we're agreed as well that 30% of the cases were in a nursing home, residential institution, community hospital, long stay, stay unit. That, that they're the, we're all working from the same figures. I, uh, and only 8.6 linked to an outbreak in a hospital. And I just wanted to set those out. And what we have in, an, in a different submission is that the difference between that is likely due to more robust supply chains for PPE in hospitals. But of course, I'm very sensitive to the, pre the presence today of Ms. Murphy, who, in using PPE, and her colleagues contracted um, COVID 19 at some point, And you said, 12 out of 19 of your colleagues contracted that in circumstances where they had been using PPE in a hospital. Could I just ask one question uh, first, just, a, just a, a policy question, and perhaps I might come back to Ms Murphy in a second. We have separate data that shows that 56% of our nursing homes had no cases of COVID. Could we just talk about those congregated settings or those um, in intensely populated settings? We also have the prisons where there had been no cases, the central mental hospital where there had been no cases. Have any of the unions got you know, feedback from members in other settings about how those managed those protection processes better or is it, was it something else? Well, again, um, I have been in direct contact with the prison service and uh, they are to be, and I said this at, at the last presentation to this committee, they are to be commended uh, in respect of the uh, fact that the prison population were protected to such a degree. And that is not an accident. That is a policy where uh, temperatures are taken, where um, all of the precautions prior to attending work are, in, you're, you're, you're in, it is to ensure that you're not in any way symptomatic. In the health service, for, by contrast, the, the, the big uh, issue we had with the derogation of staff who were asymptomatic but who had been notified as close contacts. So you get a phone call to say you're a close contact, you should self-isolate for 14 days, and then you get a phone call to say, by the way, we're very short, we need you to come in, have you had a temperature? And when you say no, they say, right, come back to work. That flies in the face of the public health advice. We have sought the removal of that policy. That policy is still there, and no healthcare worker should be derogated by a manager to return to work because they're short-staffed, even though they've been a close contact and they haven't had a test. I ask Simply you, wrong. Well, um, how long is it at the moment taking for healthcare workers to get results of, of tests? Are they all back at this stage within 24 hours for healthcare workers? It's, it's much quicker. It's improved significantly. But it, again, it depends on um, where, where, you, where you reside and where, um, where you've had your test. But in general terms, it is. It's very quick. And may I ask as well, you mentioned that Cherry Orchard had a lab playing a positive role. Are, do you know now, are all the acute hospital labs being used to try to, uh, in this way? Can you give you any update for us on, on that? Do you know? I think the, all of the lab facility is working full out, and, and my colleagues in SIP2 might be able to, to give you a better indication they represent the lab staff. Yeah, no, in fairness, I think that's correct. Um, um, all of the lab facilities are, are working flat out, um, and I think, as Phil has said, um, and I think it's evidenced in, in terms of some of the contributions that we receive back from our own members. The, the, the situation as it is today um, um, is much improved than what existed at the outset. Thank you. And this may be a question better targeted at, the, at the, the, our second session, our, the HSE, later on, but if I could elicit an opinion from you or, or your own perspective. At this stage, have all the student nurses who will qualify this year, have they been offered full-time positions, not via agency, and likewise for other healthcare professionals like physios, occupational therapists, all of those who are coming out of the universities this year, have they been offered positions? Do you know? Agreement, we have an agreement that they will be offered, but it's still a process that hasn't been completed. And I think the important thing for the student nurse population is, from our survey, many of them were traumatised by the experience of going through COVID-19 without supports. And I think we really have to be, make sure that they don't leave the profession before they qualify. And that's my aim right now. Um, we're, we're trying to get the HSE to understand that they have to support the student nurses who are in training because there is 1,700 of them graduating this year. We need every single one of them to remain working in the public health service. We're short of our colleagues who come and, and, and help us every year from the Philippines and India. We have a, a reduction in the number of registrations which I, I presented at the last um, committee uh, through the, the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland have their figures show that we are quite significantly reduced over this time last year and every year the health service and the, the private and public sector relies heavily on overseas recruitment to supplement our workforce and we need to make sure that our students when they qualify that they're protected, that they're supported and that they have a permanent job.
Could I ask as well, just we're learning more and more um, every week, and we had David Nambaro back here so some, some many weeks ago talking about the long-term implications of having had and recovered from COVID-19. And I use recovered sort of loosely because I, one of the ongoing features is, is long-term fatigue, and Ms Murphy has alluded to that initially, and again, I might come back to that, but just from a policy perspective, do you think there's a need now to review the work rosters or the structures, the sort of the 12-hour shift arrangement is recognising the ongoing nature of, of fatigue and this illness? I think the, um, the, the roster, what, what's required is frequent breaks within the roster. That's what the WHO tell us. We need frequent breaks. For example, and Siobhan is better able to, to describe this than I am, what, what is required is that when you are um, working and wearing PPE, that you are frequently relieved in order to hydrate and to, to get a break from wearing PPE. I mean, those of you that have experienced wearing masks maybe for, for the first time will understand that it's not very comfortable and you do feel quite restricted. Imagine wearing that for four hours and then getting relieved for your break. So the, the break period is the important point. As a simple example, I've had to take three, you know, three, sip, three breaks for water from wearing my mask just, to, just to, to do exactly that. So I, I totally respect what you're saying. Just putting, um, deliberately putting the policy aside now, if I could uh, come to, to Ms Murphy um, uh, with, the, with the greatest of respect, and we should have said this to you at the beginning of the session and not the end of it, but I did just want to leave a little space, and of course I, I come last in terms of questioning. Ms Murphy, you are, I think, we've had 16 public sessions now and it's my understanding and that of the Secretariat that you are the first person before the COVID committee who comes in to speak to us and to, and, and, and to attend with us as somebody who has survived and recovered from COVID. And if I could say thank you for doing that. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's remarkable that it, it has taken this long for us to speak to somebody who has actually had COVID. Thank you for coming in. I don't want to ask you in an over, overly personal way about your experience of that but recognising that your colleagues have also had you know, similar experiences having contracted people whom you know well. I wonder if, as we know, for, this, for the benefit of this committee and for the benefit of the record of the House, and also for people who may be watching and thinking about what they're doing in their own movements and how they're approaching you know, th th their interactions with other people, I wonder could you give us a sense of the general experience that you and those colleagues whom you've spoken to have had about, about how it is to, to have the illness without, at, at your, in your own way? Yeah, first of all, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here today and share my experience. Um, I'm sure a lot of nurses across the country will um, uh, resonate with what I have said today and hopefully I've left some impact on going forward how we can improve the um, service if, God forbid, there will be a second surge. Um, I can speak personally, we went from being a 31 bedded surgical ward to COVID positive ward only overnight. So we had only COVID positive patients admitted to our ward. Um, we took on the we took on the task of the full multidisciplinary team as they did their remote reviews of their patients. We were on the ward at the bedside 24 hours a day um, and that was an honour to care for patients. Um, we really do, we love our job, that's why we're there. Um, we bridged communication between patients and families using iPads, that's something we never had to do before. Um, we undertook the list is extensive, I could go on and on, um, but I suppose <laughs> The biggest change for me personally and my colleagues who contracted COVID, speaking from my experience on April 30th, so six weeks after we became a COVID ward, I became a statistic where I tested positive for COVID-19. Um, initially, I was upset and quite angry, and that was across the board with my colleagues as well. Um, as I had said previously, that I followed hospital protocol and I was competent in the use of PPE, but the emotions I initially felt were buried by the physical impact of COVID-19. I was crippled with fatigue, bedbound with headaches, um, I had extreme shortness of breath, which caused great distress as I felt like I was suffocating, um, and many of my colleagues had the same symptoms. I couldn't talk to my family or friends over the phone, I was in complete isolation. Um, I had lost a sense of taste and smell, simple tasks such as washing and dress, dressing or making a snack for myself was just unachievable as I was completely debilitated. 
Um, I presented then to the emergency department about a week later as I was deteriorating at home. Um, I was terrified. I have no underlying conditions, as I said previously, so this was a huge shock to me um, to be the patient in the emergency department um, in the hospital that I worked in. I was subsequently admitted for what I thought would be overnight observation, maybe two nights, and I was kept in for a week. I had a series of blood tests. Um, I underwent a chest x-ray. I had a CT scan of my lungs. I had a CT scan of my kidneys and other organs, just to outreal any potential damage that the impact of COVID-19 can cause. As I've said previously, there is no pattern. For six days, I was on a heart monitor 24 hours a day as my heart rate went to 170 beats per minute. Um, it, they said it was post-viral effects. So at this stage, I was negative for coronavirus, but yet I still had the post-viral effects. Just so in um, the normal heart rate would be 60 to 80 beats per minute. I was on IV fluids, which are intravenous fluids, to rehydrate me, and I was on daily injections to ensure that I didn't develop a blood clot, which I have experienced as the nurse, they can be potentially fatal, so that was a worry. Um, the days and nights were extremely long in isolation. Um, your concentration is affected massively, so even the TV on the background, you weren't paying any attention to it. Um, I was relieved to get home about a week later from being admitted, and recovering in isolation is challenging both physically and mentally, as I previously stated, but I was unprepared for the psychological impact of contracting and living with COVID-19 that transpired. Um, it has definitely prolonged my road to recovery, but I know I'll get there and hopefully go back to work um, in, at 100%. For the first time, I experienced acute anxiety, I experienced panic attacks, um, I have ongoing insomnia. Some nights I can sleep eight hours, some nights it's two to three, I don't know why. Um, I have vivid hallucinations at the very start with um, COVID-19, as did some of my colleagues, which isn't spoken about. Everybody speaks about the, the physical um, signs and symptoms, but the psychological, as I've said, are just as detrimental in your recovery. Um, 12 weeks on, I, as I said, still haven't returned to my pre-COVID health. I'm still experiencing some fatigue. One day I'll be fine, and the next I'll need to take a nap in the afternoon. Um, Shortness of breath comes and goes as well, and I'm awaiting a lung function test just to be sure to outrule that I have no lasting impact of COVID-19. And I also am very lucky that I have physiotherapy input, which I liaise with the hospital um, to regain my strength to get me back to work eventually. Thank you. Thank you so much for outlining that for us. Um, we really do appreciate it.